Hey guys, thanks for having me out. Thank you, Max, for organizing. Uh, very excited. Love the startup space. Um, any HubSpot customers? Cool. First free tip, any marketing grader users? Marketinggrader.com, free app. What's your score? Does anyone know? What's your score, sir? 80 something? Small company? That's awesome. So check out marketinggrader.com, put your URL in. 90 seconds later, it gives you a five page report on the effectiveness of marketing and how you compare to everybody else. So 80 something means that of the five million people that have done that, he's better than 80% of the companies. And like, Google's in there and Intel's in there, so that's pretty good stuff. So check that out, you'll learn something, some free tips. Um, so my name is Mark Roberge. Um, uh, my journey with HubSpot started uh, in the classroom at MIT when I sat next to a guy named Dharmesh Shah, uh, an Indian student with a t-shirt and jeans that said, do you want to help me with a startup? Um, so uh, I fortunately said yes to that question and uh, we've been scaling since. Um, HubSpot was based on a thesis that we had worked at at MIT on inbound marketing basically trying to get uh, companies to rethink the way they do sales and marketing, a little less interruption, a little more education and blogging to try to pull people toward you. Um, so we've scaled the team from one to 600 employees. I've got about 400 folks. I run sales and services, and we've scaled to 10,000 uh, customers. We have offices in Boston and in Dublin. Um, so I want to tell you guys today about kind of how I thought about approaching that problem. Now, you got to know in my background, I'm an engineer. Uh, I started my career as a Java programmer and um, real quant, real process guy. So you'll see in my sort of methodologies here that, um, you know, how that process applies here. So when I first took the job, I had a mission, which is very Aaron Ross-esque. I think Aaron was kind of writing the book when I was kind of coming up with this stuff. And it was really, my mission was on pre predictable, scalable revenue growth. And I boil it down to four tactics. And those were to one, hire the same person scalably each time. Number two, put them through the same sales training so I have a, a similar output of the type of rep that I have. Number three, provide them with the same quality and quantity of leads. And number four, hold them accountable to the same sales process. And if I can make that machine work, I will be successful in achieving my mission. Right? So that's really what my presentation is today is about those four tactics. The first one on hiring. Okay? So, um, I think every buyer context is different, and therefore the ideal salesperson for every single one of your companies is slightly different. All right? So the process to figure that out, I think, is the interesting part. And when I first took the job, I kind of wrote down 10 criteria that I thought I could interview for that I believe would correlate with success as a salesperson. And I defined what a 1 was, what a 3 was, what a 7 was, what a 10 was. And I interviewed thousands of salespeople, and I hired, like, 12 and 15 and 20, and after a year, I was able to go back and look at the top 40% and go back at their interview scores and kind of see the patterns on what was consistent there. And I looked at my bottom 20% and I could see the patterns there. And I could also reflect on what was missing. What was it about those people that actually wasn't in the score? And as the years progressed, I had enough data that I could hire an MIT PhD to do a statistical regression analysis to see if any of this stuff was predictable, and it actually was. So this is actually the first pass at that, um, you know, where the R square value was higher, there was some really nice correlations, and we could kind of build the predictive index on, out on the type of people we're actually looking for. All right, so that was the first pass. Let me do a quick survey here. I'm gonna give you three criteria, and you can guess which ones was most important by a show of hands, all right? I'll tell you the three, then I'll take the vote. The first one was um, closing ability. The second one was aggression. And the third one was coachability. All right, so which ones do you think correlated most, most with success? How many thinks it was closing ability? How many thinks it was aggression? How many thinks it was coachability? Ah, you guys are smart, smarter than me, because that wasn't in my first pass on the, on the output. But after my first year, when I reflected on the folks that really did well and the folks that didn't, the number one was coachability and it showed it in the numbers as well. So that's a big part of my interview. Like I've, I do an hour interview, like 30 minutes of it is having my guys do a role play. Hey, I'm the VP of sale, uh, marketing at a security company. You're a HubSpot sales rep, you got a lead, go, sell me. And we got five, 10 minutes of a role play. And what's most important is I, when I stop, I say, how do you think you did? How do they self-assess? How do they reflect? Do they analyze themselves? Then I say, I'm gonna coach you now. Here's one thing you did well. Here's one thing you can improve. 
and I spend four minutes coaching them. Are they glassy-eyed or are they taking notes? And then I have them redo it. And depending on how much they improve, that tells me a lot about their coachability. And if I can move the needle on them in 30 minutes, I'm really looking forward to what I can do in a day, a week, a month. And that's a big part of what I look for. Okay? The other piece is finding salespeople. Um, you know, they're great session on, on recruiting. Like, one thing that I learned, obviously, like, the, the Monsters and Craigslist don't, don't work. The thing about salespeople is um, a good salesperson never has to create a resume. A good salesperson never has to go on an interview. A good salesperson, every quarter, gets a phone call from their last two bosses to see if they're happy and, and giving them a job offer. They're always trying to get them. So you're never going to be successful in going after active sales candidates. The good guys are always passive. Right? So you've got to be out there on LinkedIn. I like to try to build a recruiting agency in my company. That's really the tactic I took. I played around with some agencies, but I really went and found agency folks, and I hired them full time, and I put them on a comp plan to bang the phones and go passively recruit people. The best channel we use is what I call the force referral. And what happens is when we hire a new person, um, after a month or two, my recruiter will schedule a meeting with you for 15 minutes if you're a new hire at our company. And they will be linked to you on LinkedIn. And they'll go through your LinkedIn connections the night before, all 500 of them. And they'll five the, find the 27 people that live in Boston, that are in sales, that come from good schools, that look like they might be a good fit. And they'll come to that meeting with that list of 27 people. And they'll say, was this person good? Was this person, do you know them? And they're like, why didn't I think of that guy? That guy was awesome. Or they'll say, that person was a cultural nightmare. Don't even go near them. Or they'll say, I can introduce you to this person. Or they'll say, I didn't know them well, but I think they're pretty good. That force referral has worked really well for us. Okay. The second part is, um, is training. Anybody here, uh, sales background, have you gone through a formal sales training program? Okay. A lot of companies that I talk to in, in training, their sales training is, hey, this is John. John's our best salesperson. You're going to sit next to John for two months and learn from him, right? Now, the problem I have with that is I have two awesome salespeople, Adam and Jen. And I found that my best salespeople kind of have one awesome superpower, and everything's sort of mediocre, and that's what makes them best. So Adam is an activity hound. If you look over Adam's shoulder at any minute of the day, he has 27 salesforce.com tabs open. He has his own special way to crank the most dials more than anyone else. And he's mediocre at everything else. He's mediocre at qualifying. He's mediocre at building trust. He's mediocre at his demo. But because he does 50% more activity, he's always one of my top guys. Then I got Jen. Jen is terrible at activity. She's mediocre at the demo. She's mediocre at everything else. But she's amazing at building rapport. 45 minutes out of an hour of demo is about the prospect's pets and their kids and church and sports teams. It's just like they're best friends and they all buy from her. Now imagine if Adam trained Jen or if Jen trained Adam. That would be terrible, right? So what I really wanted to set out to do was really produce more of a predictable factory in our training process. Um, so when people come in, they take a 150 uh, question exam at the end of sales training. They're certified on all six stages of the sales process. So I'm exposing them to the blueprint and I'm giving them the flexibility to add their superpower, to add their art, okay? The other important thing that I like to push people toward in training is think about how much sales has changed because of the internet in the last decade, right? Back in the day, sales was just memorizing the price book, memorizing the top 10 objections, memorizing the competitive differentiation and going out there and kind of withholding that information. The only way that someone could buy is talk to a salesperson. But today, you can go online at 8 o'clock in your bunny slippers on a Saturday night and find out all the vendors in the space, find out their price, find out their features. You can try the product for free, and a lot of times you can buy the product. So why do we even need sales? We kind of don't. Right? So sales has to step up their game and be a trusted advisor, be a consultant, be able to understand the unique pains and challenges of your buyers and associate them with the generic marketing messaging that your company puts out. That's really what selling is. So you as CEOs of startups, the more that you can put your salespeople in the seat of your prospects and help them feel the pain that your prospects go through every day in their job, they will become those consultants, right? Every single sales rep at HubSpot 
The first three weeks, there is no sales training. The first three weeks, they write, they build their own website on HubSpot. They write a blog using HubSpot. They create a social media following using HubSpot. They run an email marketing campaign and set up a market automation campaigns using HubSpot. They use our product and they, they build a following. They rank in Google. They create a website. It's lots of fun, but most importantly, they are such better sellers because when they get on the phone after that first month with their first marketer, they can school that marketer in a very nice way because they know so much more about generating leads through social media, SEO, et cetera, than they do because they've been through that process. Okay. All right, generating the same quality and quantity of leads. So quick survey, how many people in the room here, in the last six months you've got a cold call at work and you got engaged with that telemarketer and you ended up buying that product? Usually there's like one or two. How many people in the last six months at work or home um, have received a piece of direct mail, opened it up, very engaging, you ended up falling through and buying that product? Maybe not. What was it, sir? What was it? Wine. They got you on the wine. Cool. Good? Nice. <laughs> How many people in the last uh, six months have uh, gone into Google and done a search to start some research or maybe posted a question in LinkedIn group or social media and that research ended up uh, leading to a purchase? Okay. All right. So pretty obvious uh, survey. I've done that to students at Harvard, a group of retired senior citizens, dentists, whatever. The results are the same. There's been a huge shift that the internet has created in terms of the way that we buy. Now, what would be interesting if I repeated that survey and asked you guys about your business plans and your marketing plans and your sales plans for your business and how much money you're going to put into cold calling and advertising and direct mail and buying lists and email spam and interrupting people, there's a huge gap there. So that, you know, one of the best things we did at HubSpot was we started blogging nine months before we had a product. We, did, we just started blogging about this whole new trans, transformation. And when we had our product done, we had like 700 subscribers to our blog. It wasn't huge then, but that was a really nice entry into our free trial. We ranked number two in Google for internet marketing software after Wikipedia. And when we had to go out and raise our Series A, that was a huge part of the story. You know these investors, they like to invest in, you, in unfair advantage. And that huge pipeline that we built was a huge unfair advantage of the other folks that were trying to do something there. So that's one big mistake I see folks is they wait too long and they take the wrong tactic on demand generation. Now I'm going to give you a quick cycle on how to do that without creating a lot of time and without being too expensive. Because lots of people are like, ah, I want to do that. And it's kind of like going to the gym. On January 2nd, the gym's packed. But on March 2nd, half the people are there. And on May 2nd, no one's really there. right? So, Blogging sounds great, but you guys are super busy startup executives. You're, it's not going to happen. You're not going to walk out of here blogging two times a week. So what I encourage you guys to do is find uh, a school nearby, go over to Stanford, find a 20-year-old, 21-year-old studying journalism or English. Don't look for someone that knows your space. Don't look for someone that knows about blogging or social media. That stuff's kind of easy to learn, and you, they'll be able to tap into your heads. Look for someone who has journalism ability. They can sit down with a PhD of, in chemical engineering for an hour and pick their brain and create a beautiful piece of work. That's the skill you're looking for. So find that person as the executive. That's your biggest job. And then have them come over, whether it's for credit or 15 bucks an hour, for every Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. They come to your office. And from 9 to 10, they're going to interview you or they're going to interview someone on your thought leadership committee. It's your executive team, it's your engineers, it's your salespeople. If, you, if there's six people on that committee and you're up today, you're done for six weeks. And you sit there for an hour interview on a very niche subject on, that you know how to talk about. And that journalist spends the rest of the day, and what they're going to do is they're going to write uh, an ebook. An hour is a long time. That's more than a short blog article. They're going to write a three to five page ebook based on that niche subject. And they're also going to create a couple of blog articles, short blog articles on the same content. And they're also going to schedule a, a few dozen, you know, five or so tweets and Facebook posts for each blog article on stats and quotes that you mentioned in your interview. And they're going to schedule that over the course of the month and all those tweets are going to point back to the blog article and they're going to read the blog article and at the end of the blog article is going to be a nice call to action that says, did you like this blog article? Because maybe you'll like our five-page ebook that we wrote on the same subject. 
They click on the call to action, they're brought to a landing page, and that ebook is free in exchange for your name, title, phone number, and email address. And that's going to create you a whole bunch of leads. It's going to create you great social media authority and following. It's going to create you great rankings and organic traffic and really build a modern day demand generation that's going to change your lives and change your businesses. Okay? So the key is find that journalist. That's your job. Not to do the blog. Find your journalist and set up that content production process. It's not super expensive, easy to do in a bootstrap model. Okay, last piece is, um, is get holding these salespeople accountable to the same process. Right? So the first thing that you need is you actually do need a sales process. Here's a really basic one, one that we started out with. And uh, you know, what's interesting here is I demonstrate some of these steps, you'll start to feel that this feels different than a process that was done like five or 10 years ago. It's much more help, it's always be helping, not always be closing. It's a process that people actually enjoy and love, not ones that they feel interrupted and hate. That's the brand that you want to build. All right, so research. Something that people don't invest in much, enough time in. Corporate Executive Board states that your, um, your prospects are 57% of the way through their buying process by the time they talk to you, by the time they talk to a salesperson. Right, so it's worth that time when you get these leads to actually check them out. Go on to LinkedIn. Do they come up through product or engine? or uh, finance or marketing? Have they been at the company for a month or 10 years? Are they a VP or an intern? Who's their boss? Do they know your cousin? Do they know someone at your company? This is all amazing information, right? So spend the time and find that. Um, prospecting. So I get tons of cold calls. I get like 20 a day. And it's the same cold call every time from the sales rep, same rep five, five times in a row. It's just like huge lost opportunity. Like prospecting is about the context that these people are coming to you from. So the first thing you have to do is you have to equip your sales team with the information of how these prospects are engaging you. Every single rep should know how that lead found you. Was it through a Google search and for what term? What pages do they look at? What blog articles do they read? Are they following you on social media? Have they tweeted anything about you? Have they received any emails from you? And which ones did they open? And which things did they download? That's the start of the buying process and that's what I need to be successful in sales. So I can leave you a message and say, the first one's like, hey, John, it's Mark from HubSpot. I noticed you downloaded our ebook and Facebook, generating leads through Facebook. I took a look at your Facebook company profile and had a couple quick tips that I'll email to you now. Give me a call if you want to go through that email. Right? The second voicemail is not the same. The second voice, you know, it's a dialogue, right? It's like, hey, John, it's Mark again from HubSpot. Um, you know, hey, good news, I found a customer of ours that's in your industry that had success with Facebook marketing, I'm gonna send you an email on what they did to be successful. Give me a call if you wanna go through it. Right? The third voicemail is, John, great news. I ran the marketing grader report of that competitor, that person in your industry, uh, against you, and it sounds like there's more opportunity beyond Facebook to generate leads. It's a dialogue, right? And the last one's always critical, it's the breakup. John, it's Mark from HubSpot. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that you solved your lead generation problem. Give me a call in the future if you ever change your mind. That has the best callback rate. Because oftentimes they're listening, and the, if you've done a good job adding value, they like that, and they call right back, and like, yeah, I'm free at noon tomorrow, et cetera. The cheesiest one that I've gotten was uh, some guy called me and said, hey, John, hey, Mark, it's John from XYZ Company. And he said, um, my boss told me I have to call you seven times in the next month, so do us both a favor and give me a call back. Right, so if you want the cheese factor, you can go for that. It didn't work on me. I let him call me seven times. But uh, that one was pretty good. Um, all right, the other thing I'm prospecting is, is your, your guys are about to invest like a month of time calling this lead. There's easy tools out there to make sure they're listening, right? Like when I get these cold calls, if they do strike my interest, the first thing I'm gonna do is open their email. And I do that and I don't get a call. I might go to their website and I do that and I don't get a call. I might mention them on social media or a competitor to see who's bought them, et cetera, and I do that and I don't get a call. It's crazy. These guys are sitting here with this list calling, and yet these buying signals are happening, and the sales team's not equipped with the right tools to listen. So make sure that's like kind of bare minimum today. It's not hard technology. Make sure you're listening. I'm sure you've learned a lot about that at today's conference. Um, and then finally, the connect. You know, again, um, this is not leading with the elevator pitch. This is leveraging the lead intelligence. You know, just like that, that voicemail. You know, hey, John, it's Mark from HubSpot. Um, I noticed you downloaded our ebook on Facebook marketing. What questions did you have? That's really good lead in, right? And they'll blow you off, like, ah, oh, you know, I didn't really know I was going to get a phone call from a salesperson. Well, that's okay. I took, took a look at your company uh, Facebook page and I had two quick tips. Do you want to know what they are? 
And yeah, sure, I'll, I'll listen to them. Now they're thinking that I got some dumb sales rep that's reading the script. But when I give them some tips that are actually, they learn something, that's awesome. And the turning point of that interaction is when they ask you a question. That's huge. You're going from a half percent opportunity close right now to like 10 or 20 percent. That's a huge turning point. And I just like to give them a super smart answer, two, three minutes, and then awkward pause. Because usually like another question's coming. I like to give them another really smart answer, awkward pause. And sometimes on a good day, they'll say, is there something I could buy from you? That's, I've had that asked to me. I mean, that's a great question to get when you're in sales. You know, so I'm not sure, but what I can do is I'll spend more time on your website tonight, your competitor's website, and I'll conduct an analysis for you. Are you free at 9.30 tomorrow to go over it? Oh, I've got a meeting at 9.30, but I'll move it to talk to you, right? That's what it really feels like. And, you know, if you're able to, to execute on these different steps and train your folks to really live your prospect's life and be able to advise them like that and give them inbound leads where people came to you to get educated on a problem that's important and you approach it in this type of a sales way. Like, it doesn't happen all the time, but this relationship, it starts to feel less like a salesperson and a prospect and more like a doctor and a patient. You know what I mean? Like, when you go to the doctor and they're like, do you have heart disease in your family? Do you smoke? Like, you don't withhold information. You tell the truth because that doctor is diagnosing your situation. And when they prescribe to you the pills and say, take these pills, you're not like, let me think about it, or can I get 20% off? Like, you take the pills. You see the diploma on the wall, and you take the pills. And that's what it feels like when you execute this well. It doesn't happen all the time, but that's what you can get with some of these folks, is that sort of doctor-patient relationship. Right? So the last piece I'll, I'll, I'll end you with is what I call metrics-driven sales coaching. And, um, and I'll open up for questions here. But um, I, uh, uh, I like my managers to maximize the time they spend coaching. My managers are sales coaches. I don't like them pushing forecasts and papers. They have to do that, but I want to maximize the time coach they coach. And uh, the analogy I give on coaching is I've tried to learn to play golf for like 10 years, and I've had a bunch of lessons. And I had one guy who was like, all right, take a swing. And I took a swing, and he's like, all right, Try turning your hand over a little bit in your grip, lean back in your stance, put more weight on your right foot, think one o'clock on the back swing, not two o'clock, and slam those wrist things when you, when you swing. And I was like, dude, it's too much at once. You know, I had another guy who was like, all right, Mark, take a swing. He's like, all right, try this grip. Take 100 swings. 20 minutes later, he's like, how's that feel? Oh, it feels good. All right, now try leaning back a little bit more in your stance. Take another 100 swings. 20 minutes later, how's that feel? It's good. That's sales coaching, right? That's the biggest mistake that new managers make is new managers were typically good at what they did, and hopefully they bring other skills to this, like empathy and coaching and listening and all that kind of stuff. But they get a new rep, and they're overwhelmed of the gap between where that rep is today and where they want them to be, and they just throw up on them like that first golf pro, and it does no good. It just overwhelms your salesperson. And the real excellence to sales coaching is for them to be able to do what the second guy did, was to recognize, he saw the same thing. He saw how bad my swing was in every single dimension, but he knew the one thing that would make the biggest difference. And that's what great sales coaching is. And I like to use the metrics to give me guidance, right? So I'll, I'll rank my reps in their sales funnel, and I'll do a little income statement on that. Like, how many leads did they get? How many did they work? How many got to the demo stage? How many did they close? And what are the conversion rates between them? And this helps me isolate how my new guys who are struggling are different from my top guys. Where are they broken? And based on where they're broken in the funnel, I can prescribe the right coaching for that skill. If they're, if they're broken at the top, you know, on the connect rate, then you know, we're gonna work on some, some connect calls, et cetera. If they're broken in the demo, I gotta listen to some demos to further diagnose it. And my first instinct is always, can I isolate it further in the data? So if I find that they're broken, they're working lots of leads, but they're not getting any demos, can I learn more from that in the data? Right? Like, is the problem that they're working lots of leads, but they're not getting any connects? Or is the problem that they're getting them on the phone, but they're not getting the demo? Because depending on what the answer to that, my coaching is way different. In the top one, I got to look at their emails and listen to their voicemails to make sure they're personalizing them, they're using the right cadence, they're using the right frequency, they're using the right depth. 
In the bottom one, they're screwing up the connect. So I gotta listen to some connects to make sure they're breaking the ice right and they're selling the value, they're building trust and selling the value of that next step, right? So that metrics driven sales coaching has been really, really powerful for us as we've scaled up that team. So that's my show. Thanks, guys. Questions? Good. Hi. Um, how do you train salespeople to recognize time wasters and then deal with time wasters? Because a lot of what you're prescribing, this kind of doctor patient relationship, is great in big companies, but for small companies, like a lot of the people here, they don't have time to do all this, just talk to people that are doing a lot of research and not actually wanting to buy the product. Okay, I see. I I uh, like where you're going in the beginning. I, I, I got to get some clarification on the second part. But like, you're, you're right. That's a very common diagnosis for someone who'd have like a low demo to close ratio is what they're doing is they're pushing too deep in the sales process. You got to qualify really early, right? So what I like folks to do is first off, uh, if you can pull off an inbound lead generation program, the best thing you can do is you, you, um, you got to filter your leads. Don't just pass everything over. Because that's kind of the difference here is in outbound you start with a qualified list and you, you kind of crank up against them and shake that tree as hard as you can. Now you're starting with good fit people and you're trying to shake out and find the people who have pain. In inbound that model is reversed. Everyone finding you has the pain. They wouldn't have done the Google search. They wouldn't have downloaded the ebook. But they're not all a good fit. Some are awesome but some are like PhD students in Japan that are just doing research, right? So the first thing you have to do is filter, and then once you figure out directionally that this person might be a prospect, you got to. Tr I would train your reps to spend a few minutes. I still would do the research when you get to that stage. I still would take the few minutes to build trust, and then as I build that trust, I can do a little give-get with them. As I'm giving them information, I can ask them tougher questions like, you know, um, do you need to generate more leads? What's your plan to do that? And based on the answers to that, I'm going to start thinking about whether I want to move them forward in the process. So I'm not going to take them through a whole sales cycle if they're not qualified, but I need to be able to trust enough to be able to know if they're a good fit or not and then make a decision. Now, I think you also had a part, what do you do then? Um, just break up in a really friendly way, like spend a few more minutes. I'm going to send you some free information. And you know, if these, the following things change, let me know. In the meantime, do you know any people running marketing in other companies? See if you can get a referral. Okay, cool. Hey, Jen. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Hey, hey Jen, how are you? Good, how are you? Former HubSpotter. Yep. Um, two things, one, the HubSpot alumni all, all want me to ask you if you have plans for the weekend. Mark is famous Fine. for asking everyone about their weekend. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I, I'm keeping this on the super, don't tweet this, seriously. For Halloween this year, I am Chewbacca. It's huge, huge news, and no one knows it except you guys and my family. <laughs> and I live next to Salem, which is the Salem Mass is like the Halloween capital of the world. So most weekends around this time, I take my five and six year old boys, and they dress up, and I dress up, and we go around and scare people in Salem. So that would be my weekend plan. But my real question <laughs> is, uh, I know that we were pretty heavily scripted at first, and now Heavy what? heavily scripted yes. at first, right? There's the take two beats here, etc. When do you know when to tell people to depart from the script? It's something yes. we're struggling with right now. Okay, so basically in sales training, start with a nice tight sales script because there's so much going through their heads. And then, you know, you don't want to be a sweatshop just reading a script that's like telemarketing-esque. How do you let them go and right. hard, and you know, it's you like, like when totally is your, screw it up. <laughs> yeah, it's like when is your five-year-old ready to take the training wheels off? It's like kind of, you know, you kind of see it. Um, you know, if you're selling to the enterprise, you got to be way more careful about that because you get only so many swings. If you're more transactional, I'd probably throw them out there a little sooner. You, they got to make some mistakes. Um, usually, as well, you can um, do a lot of modeling and role playing in safe environments to see if they're ready. Like, um, do, you know, prep calls and post mortem calls are so powerful in, in sales management. It's like. Sometimes I philosophically challenge my sales managers, like imagine if you didn't get on any calls. Imagine if you spent all your day just meeting with sales reps before their calls and doing a prep and role playing and that kind of stuff, and then meeting with them after to see how they did. I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity to get your answer there is to see how prepared they are to get off that script and do it, okay? Good. 
So given a limited team, if the people at your target organizations with the pain are not necessarily the people with the money and the decision making yes. power, you know, you have to choose where to spend your time and where to actually really grow those relationships. Yes. Where do you spend the time? Yeah, so the people kind of coming to you, the end users, you have a value prop for them, but they don't have the money. They don't have the money. The people with the money and the decision making power are so far removed from the pain yep. that it's totally. like two, two different worlds. Why does the decision maker want to spend the money? Well, What's what, going on in their world? I mean, essentially, our theory is that if you can get the end user with the pain to come knocking on their yeah, door, sure. then they'll yeah. spend the money. Yeah, so the very, very common problem, selling through influencers. You have the end users who can be your influencers, your coaches, your champions, and there's the decision makers with the money. And especially in an inbound model, this becomes a, a, a bigger problem because there was the old uh, days of like calling high, call high, call high, just call the people with the money and have a value prop that resonates with them. Um, this day and age, more of the inbound leads don't come from the decision makers or the people with money. They come from the end users. And so there's a bunch of different nuances you can do. You have to sell them in different ways because they have different needs. Like, I, I don't know what your specific role is, but I can tell. This is outbound too. Okay, so if it's outbound, I'd probably just call the people with money potentially, but you can, you can take this advice and, and, and do both. So let's take uh, the HubSpot situation. So we have the same thing. We have marketers who want our tool, like uh, marketing associates that want our tool to save time. It's awesome, right? So we can pitch that to them. That's their value prop. Now, the VP of marketing has the money. If you pitch the VP of marketing, to spend this much money so Susan can save time, you're never going to win a deal. But the VP of marketing wants HubSpot because they're struggling to generate leads. Completely different value prop, or they're struggling with Coca or something else, some VP of marketing type lingo or value prop. So we have to redo our sales process and our messaging around something that the VP of marketing wants. Now we have to do it on both sides because I can't just sell the VP of marketing and not have the end user bought in. I can't have the end user bought in, but not the VP of marketing. So it's a dual stage um, sale. And sometimes it's like what, what we'll typically do is call the decision maker first, usually get a voicemail, and just say, you know, we've been getting some inquiries from your business, your, your, your division on XYZ, or if it's outbound, you can just lead with some of your elevator pitch and maybe some other folks in the space that are using the product. And then I can call the end user right after that. Sometimes the end users are a little easier to get on the phone and engage with. I'm going to sell them on their value prop, and then once we do, we'll work together on how to get to the actual decision maker. And the worst situation is to have that person be selling the decision maker. Unless they're in sales, they're probably not good at that. And now you're stuck to be the sales coach. What you want to do is to be able to go in with them and do the selling and kind of coach them on like, all right, I'm glad you're bought in. Now let's talk about um, you know, uh, Mary here as the VP of marketing. Like, what does she care about these days? Why would she want to buy this? Oh, to save me time. Bullshit. She doesn't want to save you time. Like, then we have to work on that together and go into that meeting together. Cool? All right. Yeah, I'm just curious. Does, I know that you've talked a lot about how bad or whatever, how bad outbound is. Yeah. Uh, do you guys, does HubSpot do any outbound lead gen or do you 100% yeah. do inbound? Yeah, we do. We didn't do it for the first four years, um, and then we introduced it just as a lever, right? So now we can, we can trade off growth rate with margin, right? So we've run, we're doing probably like, uh, today we're probably doing like 60% through inbound, 30% through channel, and 10% through outbound. And the inbound and channel have the best metrics around it, payback period, LTV to CAC, all that kind of stuff. The outbound still works from a profitability standpoint, but it's less. And now we can go into our board meetings and say, all right, what growth rate do you guys want next year? I can get this much from, like, do you want, you know, 70% at this margin or 100% at this margin? And that just tweaks the levers that we do. So that's the reason why we do it. It still, it still works. I mean, you know, when I'm consulting, to, if I were to just consult the companies and I didn't work at HubSpot, I mean, I'd say do both. I, it's just I think the big problem is, like, most of the time you find it's 90% outbound and 10% inbound, and like, it's really hard to build a business that way these days. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. Cool. Thanks for the time, guys. I'll be around after.